All right. Um, moving, moving on along with our um, diagnostic or our um, assessment tools, we've got our capnometry, which is that CO2, and then waveform capnometry. Whenever you intubate a patient, cardiac arrest, or anything else, um, you need to make sure that you've got uh, your uh, waveform capnography on, which is usually connected to your monitor. All right. Make sure that you've got a um, waveform on your screen and then make sure that you've got your CO2 level. All right, normal CO2 levels are what? 35 to 45, right? Um, one of the pushings behind this is just the fact that as more and more research has been done on cardiac arrest management, one of the best indicators for um, effective compressions is return of CO2, all right? because that's going to tell you that you're having oxygenation take place, right? Um, then your color metric device, you all should be very familiar with that. Yellow means yes. We're looking forward to change from purple to yellow. And that's going to be a um, confirmation tool as well. We're looking for a, a, a normal catenogram, which you're going to have your plateau, and then your, your inspiratory, and then your expiratory. Um, it's going to be measured in, in pressure, all right? So a lower shark fin appearance. That's going to show, um, this is just an example, it's going to show uh, bronchospasm, all right? This is what I was talking about with CPR compressions. If you got a sudden increase in CO2 while doing compressions, then that indicates uh, ROS. Your peak expiratory flow, this is a maximum rate at which a patient can expel air. It's not really a diagnostic test that we're going to use a lot in the field. Um, basically, most folks can uh, expel 350 to 700. Um, anything at 150 or below per minute is going to be inadequate. All right, reassessment. We know what to reassess, right? We're looking for mental status. We're looking for changes in SpO2. Um, we're going to offer psychological support. Uh, our intervention. So we may need autonomic nervous interventions, all right? We may need to stimulate the sympathetic or the parasympathetic. Um, or we may need to work against the parasympathetic. What would be an example of a medication we might give to work against the parasympathetic? What about sludge when you have organophosphate poisoning and you start pouring? Atropine, all right, and anticholinergic. Anticholinergics are going to dry things up, all right? Some of your medications that you may take to limit secretions are going to be anticholinergic medications, all right? Um, with your parasympathetic stimulation, decreased heart rate, bronchoconstriction, with your sympathetic increased heart rate and bronchodilation. Um, so, one of our main medications that we're going to give is a bronchodilator, right? When we're managing respiratory, other than oxygen, one of the more common medications is going to be a bronchodilator. So, you've learned mainly albuterol, all right? Albuterol is a beta-2 selective sympathomimetic, right? So, it will cause bronchodilation, but at the same time, it will cause increased heart rate, irritability, it will cause um, increased blood pressure. Ipertropium um, is a medication that, that is a combo medication. It uh, contains albuterol and ipertropium. Albuterol for your beta-2 properties. Ipertropium is going to be your anticholinergic, so it's going to help drive those secretions. All right? Um, anticholinergics are a central component to management of COPD because they have excessive secretions and they're not able to get them out. Aerosol therapy, nebulizers. Has everybody had a chance to hook up a nebulizer to put it together? There's nothing to it, right? You just pour your medication in there and then you turn your oxygen on and you look for the aerosol, the, the nebulized gas to start forming and you have them breathe. Um, there's a couple of ways you can do it. You can put it on a mask, you can put it on the, I call it the cigar style, all right? Um, needs to be at least six liters per minute. Now, now 
this is kind of a, a nickism, just observations that I've made in the field and observations that I've made when, when re related to medication. But which, which delivery method of albuterol or a bronchodilator do you think is going to be the preferred use for pre-hospital? The nebulized, instead of the metered dose inhaler. The metered dose inhaler, you're going to have to have patient cooperation with the uh, aerosol therapy. But with your metered dose inhalers, they're going to have to do everything right to get that medication in, right? At least with this, it's nebulized and they can just breathe it in over a longer period of time. Um, aerosol therapy is not just albuterol, all right? Now, for us, there's not a lot of other medications that we can give aerosol therapy, but there are... Um, there are types of medications that you can give or they can give. Um, they can give corticosteroids, inhalation method, all right? What would, what would a corticosteroid do? What does a steroid do? Right, it, it fights inflammation, very common medication for folks that have chronic inflammation, such as COPD. Um, you can give anesthetic agent, all right? They can put a little lidocaine in there, that'll help numb. Antitussives, mucolytics, all right? Mucolytics, one of them is mucomist. Mucomist is also the antidote for what? What do y'all know? Silenol. Silenol. Have any of y'all on your respiratory therapy clinicals smelt mucomist? It smells like rotten eggs, rotten eggs. They thought it was funny up in the unit to save a little bitty dab of it and then go rub it on somebody's back and they'd walk around smelling like eggs the rest of the day. All right? Yeah, it's hilarious unless you're the one that's smelling like rotten eggs all day. Maybe it was and maybe it wasn't. All right? Your meter dose inhalers, so for the best way for them to work is to get that spacer. Um, the biggest thing with the NDI is that you're going to have to have full cooperation. They're going to have to be prepared to suck in a full breath, all right? If you use a spacer, they need to know to suck instead of to blow, all right? Um, when they inhale, which is going to be kind of hard if they're having an asthma attack, when they inhale, they need to hold it in, right? Because that medication needs to get in and, and wrap around. That's the good thing about aerosol therapy is that it can slowly get in and it can slowly start easing and they can actually start getting more and more of it in, all right? Now, if it's a meter dose inhaler that has a corticosteroid in it, they need to rinse their mouth out, all right? That's going to be your Salmedrol or your Spiriva, the purple disc packs, all right? If they don't, then they can get what's called thrush in their mouth which is just a yeast infection in the back of their throat and on their tongue. If the patient can't move air, don't uh, do it. Now, that's one of the cool things. I meant to bring it up here. We won't say it down in the scenarios today for those of you that are with me. Um, the new CPAPs. Those of you that work at ETS, you know, and I think we showed everybody last semester, they've got um, where you can actually do albuterol treatments with CPAP. I think that's pretty awesome. All right, your dry powder inhalers, um, nothing that we're going to really give in the field, but these are going to be medications that they may have, all right? This is where they actually may crush a peel in the inhaler, all right? Or it may just be dry powder. And then definitely want to do a good respiratory documentation, okay? So your goal is to support oxygenation or ventilation, right? Your number one goal should be to stabilize and get them to the hospital as quick as possible. Always maintain an airway. You know how to do that. Try to get them to um, decrease work of breathing. Work of breathing gets too much, then they're going to fatigue, right? They're going to use more energy than what they can produce. One of the... the one of the first treatments that should be done for any patient in respiratory distress is have them sit up, all right? 
Going to a nursing home. Old Miss Jones isn't breathing good. Have her sit up. If she can't sit up, get her on the stretcher and sit her up. All right? Because when we're laying flat, that's got all of our muscles contracted. And also, if there's fluid in the lungs, it all is kind of diffused through the lungs. At least if we sit them up, it's going to drain to the bottom and we still can have oxygenation in the upper lobe. Um, oxygenation, we talked about it. Just administer what needs to be administered. All right? Now, as far as it comes to like hypoxic drive and things like that, I think from what I read is the two hour mark. High flow oxygen is not going to really affect the hypoxic drive for in the first two hours. But as the body gets accustomed to these high flow oxygen values, it's going to um, start having issues. And what happens is, is that they become dependent on it. And always, 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 your goal, long term goal of oxygen therapy is to slowly decrease the amounts of oxygen to where they're getting back to breathing atmospheric level, which is 21%, what we're breathing right now. There's a huge gap between 21% and 100%, right? So we have to titrate it slowly back. Again, your, your, your thoughts are always, what's best for the patient? What, what can I do now to help them have a full recovery? Your goal should not just be to drop them off at the hospital. You're not being a patient advocate. Your goal should be what is best for this patient, the full picture in mind, all right? If your goal is just to stabilize and kick them out, then let the hospital deal with it, then you know, you're going to do therapies or you might do things that might not be what's best for the patient, all right? Bronchodilators, we talked about it a little bit. Why wouldn't they be effective in pneumonia or pulmonary edema or heart failure, heart disease? Yeah, bronchodilators aren't going to do anything for fluids, right? Your fast-acting bronchodilators are what we're going to give in the field. Albuterol, atropine, things like that. Does anybody that works at any other service besides ETS use Atrovent? Do y'all? I know that we did when I worked in Tripp County. And what it was was we used Atrovent and Albuterol and we mixed them together. Um, then your slow-acting bronchodilators, these are going to be these are going to be medications that they may take <coughs> on a home regimen every day. Alright? Um, Salmetrol um, or this other one, I don't know, chromalin. Um, methyl exanthines, these are going to be older medications that patients used to take for um, obstructive disorders. Um, there's still some out and about nowadays, but it's not as often as you'd see them. Theophylline is one of them. Um, what was the other one? I wrote it down. Anyways, um, the problem with these types of medications are is that they have cardiac issues and hypotension. So some of your older patients that have had long-term chronic, they've been on these medications, they may still be on them. All right. Electrolytes. Magnesium is a bronchodilator. Mag sulfate is a bronchodilator. When I worked in Georgia, we actually had a protocol to start a mag sulfate drip after we had tried a bronchodilator and we had given... Um, um, steroids, we can start a mag sulfate drip, all right? It would be a last resort. You probably wouldn't start a mag sulfate drip in the field, all right? But do know that mag has a role in bronchodilation. Um, corticosteroids. The reason why we would give corticosteroids is because of inflammation, right? So a person that has chronic inflammation are going to be on a chronic uh, corticosteroid uh, regimen. Adverse effects, obviously immune issues, um, Cushing syndrome, all right, not Cushing's triad, but Cushing syndrome, a, what, what, what system does Cushing affect? An endocrine system, all right. And then um, corticosteroids also really greatly affect uh, blood sugar. They actually 
shoot blood glucose up. Um, there are some inhaled uh, corticosteroids that may be part of a um, home regimen or you may see these making their way onto the ambulance because that inflammation helps. I mean, that uh, anti-inflammatory helps. And then IV corticosteroids, methylprednisone, um, hydrocortisone, uh, solumedrol, all medications that you would give somebody acutely to um, help with inflammation, acute asthma attacks, COPD, things like that. Vasodilators. Why would a vasodilator help in some... in, in um, some respiratory disorders. Okay, right. So with like pulmonary edema, CHF, if we can open up the container, limit the, <coughs> lower the amount of preload that's coming back, we're not going to have as much fluid coming back at one time. All right? Nitro can help with that. Used to, we give morphine, and they thought that morphine would really help. All right, it doesn't vasodilate the way they thought it did, but nitro will. Make sure they don't take a phosphodiesterase inhibitor. What is that? What is that medication that you're not supposed to take? What? Yeah, Cialis, Viagra, things like that. You'll see that on any time, any time that you're going to give a nitrate. Make sure that they don't have ED and take a medication for it if they do. All right. They restore fluid balance. Now, obviously, we're not going to administer a lot of fluids to patients that have um, pulmonary edema issues, right? That have fluid overload issues. But now, there are some diseases where fluid will help, especially in younger patients. If you remember from advanced EMT, one of your main treatments for all the respiratory issues with children were. Y'all remember? Hydration and humidification. All right? Trying to break this junk up. Then diuretics. So diuretics, we're going to give those to help pull some of this fluid from circulation. Helps pull it off the lungs. Before we administer a diuretic, if we've got a patient that we feel like that we need to administer a diuretic for, we definitely need to do what before we get that? We need to try what other treatment? CPAP, right? CPAP works a lot better, a lot quicker. Now, they may get on um, diuretic therapy, all right? But if we were to give a diuretic in the field, which one do you think it would be? Lasix. What is your typical dosage of Lasix? What? 20 to 40, all right? So, yeah, typically it's about 40, 20 to 40. All right, so your book um, says 0 0.5 to 1 milligram per kilogram. Everything I've ever seen just says 40, all right? If it doesn't work, then double it to 8. If a patient's already on Lasix therapy, then double the dose that they take, okay? The problem with Lasix and uh, Bumex, Bumetanide, is that they are not potassium sparing. They're loop diuretic. And when they pull off fluid, they pull off electrolytes as well, namely potassium and sodium, okay? So you also have to worry about electrolyte imbalances. So sometimes it's just a lot better just to, to try CPAP and try to do things that way. And ferrosamide, things like that, it's not going to work. It's going to work a little bit, but it's not going to do what CPAP will do instantly, okay? And then CPAP and BiPAP, um, Y'all know about your CPAP, provides pressure to help push air in and it splints to keep the alveoli open and further pushes the fluid out, all right? Folks with OSA, uh, sleep apnea, they use one of these at home, all right? Now, you've got CPAP and BiPAP. Um, well, CPAP, it just, it continues to push pressure and they breathe against that pressure and in turn, those two pressures collide, creating more pressure in the lung, all right? The pressure is not so great that they can't breathe over it, but it is a little bit higher pressure and it's not a natural way to breathe. So it's gonna take some coaxing or some talking the patient into it, all right? CPAP, you gotta watch your pressures. Of course, you could cause some type of barometric trauma. Um, pneumothorax, you could do uh, sub-Q air. 
And it could also block Venus return. You start increasing that intrathoracic pressure, it's going to start increasing the pulmonary pressures, namely your pulmonary artery and your pulmonary vein. If those pressures get too high, then you start having issues with pulmonary return or blood returning back to the heart, which is your oxygenated blood. All right? CPAP, when we place it on, the only way for it to work is going to do is going to be what? Have a good seal, right? The only other way for it to work is if the patient is breathing on their own, right? It, it is not a ventilatory mechanism. It's not a ventilatory uh, tool. I almost said stool. Um, has anybody actually got to see it work and work right? It, it, it's usually instant relief. If you can talk these patients into putting it on, at least in the next couple minutes, they're not fighting it anymore because they know that it's helping them breathe. What what's the hard part about CPAP is just getting them to put it on. All right, so you may not necessarily just jump on and just slam it on their face real quick. You may have to hold it on and let them see, hey, this is going to help me breathe. And then you can, once somebody that can't breathe, if they can figure out a way for them to breathe again, they're not going to fight it a whole lot. All right? What's very frustrating is you finally get a patient calm down, get that CPAP on, and then they get to the ER and they have to get a room air sat, and they snatch it off. That happened to me when, it first, when we first started using CPAP on the ambulance over in Columbus. And then your BiPAP, it, it, the same idea as CPAP, except it just delivers a much lower pressure upon expiration. All right. Transport ventilators, um, they're usually going to be just have minimal settings. Um, I never use one in East Alabama. I use it all the time at, at AMR. But basically, our role with ventilation is we're going to provide BVM in an acute setting. If it is a transfer or something like that, usually the settings are made by respiratory therapy or the doctor or someone like that. And um, usually we don't mess with it a whole lot. All right. And then intubation. Intubation is going to be a vital tool, but it's going to be a last ditch effort tool. All right. We're going to try everything else. And oftentimes, CPAP is going to be our saving grace from having to intubate. So many things can go wrong with intubation. All right? We can get that tube first in, and then by the time we get to the hospital, moving them around, it could have slipped into their stomach, and this whole time we've been ventilating their stomach. So many things can go wrong with that patient. All right? So you want to hold your intubation for the last ditch effort. All right? Again, go back to your H's and T's. Make sure that the underlying cause can be fixed or cannot be fixed. Um, then there's uh, sub-Q, uh, beta agonist, epinephrine. We would give epinephrine if we have, especially like in asthma, if we try everything. All right. That's why epinephrine is a very good drug for like anaphylaxis because of the bronchoconstriction. It opens it up. And then terbutaline is a medication that, that we won't use a whole lot, but it does some of the same things. Um, if we have to get medication out of ET2, we double the dose, right? Cool. Obstructions. Move it, right? That's our treatment. Try to get the obstruction out. If it's such a large obstruction, such as um, laryngeal spasm, angioedema, Last ditch effort would be needle precotherotomy, right? Maybe not so much in our area yet, but as paramedics, this is part of standards that that may be your next step. All right. Always do the uh, the the smallest maneuvers first. Start with your basics. Try to get the airway opened up. All right. Inflammation caused by infection. Um, usually, these infections will lead to laryngotracheobronchitis, more affectionately known as crew, things like that.
So when you start thinking of the diameter of the tubes as far as like restriction and all that, you got to think about what's actually happening when these tubes restrict, all right? Your bronchioles, when they constrict down. Number one, you're having a harder time getting airflow in, so you're not getting as much delivered. And number two, you're increasing pressures. When you have restricted diseases, or when you have you know, acute restriction, constriction, it's like going from breathing through this to breathing through that, right? Our goal is going to do what is going to be what? Is going to restore this back to this, right? So this is this French guy's law. Basically, as the diameter of a tube decreases, resistance to flow increases. Fire department, they call that what? Friction loss. So basically, if I had, if I had air being pushed through this, and then I had a way to seal this off, as that, hair, as that air hits this smaller tube, what's going to happen? It's going to reduce flow, and it's going to take a lot more pressure to get it through there, right? So it's going to take a lot more work to get it through there. Same thing with your um, tubes in your uh, bronchial tree. With these inflammation caused by infection, especially croup and tonsillitis, if you've got kids that, that are displaying any of this, drooling, coughing, fever, um, hoarseness, we do not want to mess with that airway. Right? Because we do not want to, what? Agitate it. We don't want to uh, get it, cause it to get worse. If it is to the point to where we're having to intubate these patients, this isn't the time. You know, it's kind of one of those things, in order to get credit, you've got to have credit. In order to get experience, you've got to actually do something. But unfortunately, this isn't the time really to, to work with that when a kid's about to die if they don't get innovated. So you really want to try to get the most experienced person with innovation to do this. And they got one shot, one shot only, more than likely. And if they don't get it, what's going to happen? They may swell up, right? And then we're looking at other um, extreme forms of airway. If innovation is necessary, you want to try to get an ET tube that's too size is smaller. So if they need a 6.5, get a 4.5. All right? Because we want to, to try to get that in, and they're already swollen up. And then if it doesn't work, they may have to have a cricothyrotomy. Aspiration. You've got a couple types of aspiration. You may just aspirate, you know, vomit. That's chemical aspiration, right? Um, You can aspirate medications, anything that's going to go into the lungs that isn't supposed to be there, all right? Um, Tube-fed patients, folks that have tube feedings, if they're laid back, that stuff's going to come back up. It's just fluid. Um, impaired swallowing, unresponsive patients. If they have a foreign body, aspiration of the foreign body may occur. <sighs> Determine the scenario of sudden onset of dyspnea. What caused the problem? Okay. And then if they aspirate, we're going to suction. We're going to try to prevent further aspiration. They may need an NG tube. If what's causing them to aspirate is gastric distension and it's pushing that fluid back, we may need to get an NG tube and suction that stuff out of their stomach. Okay. Let's stop here. Um, we're going to get behind. Let's stop here because I want 